Last week, we began our, our year-long journey going through the Gospel of John, and um, we're going to pick up right there where we left off, but I want to pray again. Let's just take a minute and, and uh, ask God to speak to us this morning. You, you guys heard about what's going on down there in Asbury Theological Seminary down in Kentucky? You heard about this? If you haven't heard, you should just Google it, um, where um, this... That they're calling it a revival is breaking out. It's, it's, it's been going on since Wednesday, not Wednesday four days ago, but Wednesday 12 days ago, um, the 8th, and um, just nonstop students praying and confessing um, and worshiping Jesus, testimonies of what God is doing. It's starting to spread. People are coming from states all around, and there's nothing uh, sensational about it. There's nothing um, celebratory about it. It's it's very seems very genuine, very authentic of God pouring out a spirit. And God will pour out a spirit where he finds people that are just hungry. People that are hungry for him and that just want him. And, um, and that's why we do what we do. To, to be honest with you, you would say, what's the goal of, of this gathering right here? The goal of this gathering is that we would seek out the presence of God. I mean, that's what we, you go, we come together to meet God. That's what we want through worship and the word. And so, um, so let's, let's pray for hungry hearts. Let's, let's have a spiritual hunger about us and ask God to increase that. As it says in Psalms, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Maybe you're here today and your longing is, is not very strong and your, your soul is not panting after the Lord. Let's just ask him to give us a hunger. So let's pray together as we open his word. Father, we come and... We recognize that there's a lot of things that can kind of quench our, our hunger and our thirst for you, God. There's bad diet plans that we feed ourselves, Lord, that kind of spiritually quenches our appetite. So, God, I pray that you'd forgive us for that, and I pray that you'd reveal that to us. And, God, I pray this morning that for each one of us here that you would give us a desire for more. I thank you, God, with you there's always more that there's always a next that you have for us, God. There's always more that you have in in knowing you and loving you and following you, God, that you have for us because you're a good father. I thank you, God, for those things. I pray, God, even now as we go through John, open our eyes, God. Open our ears that we might see you and hear from you in ways, Lord, that are, are new and afresh. Holy Spirit, bring your word to life. I pray this morning in Jesus' name, amen, amen. That's the goal as we're going through John. Let's see Jesus as he really is, who he is and as he is. We said last week, we don't get to define who he is. We don't get to say things like, well, my God will do, and like as we all have our personal version of God, we're going to see Jesus as he truly is as we go through the gospel of John. Just as a reminder real quick, and if you weren't here last week, maybe go back. It might be good to kind of catch up. We did some background and intro. John is the youngest of Jesus' 12 disciples. He wrote five books of the New Testament, uh, including the last book of the Bible, the book of, the book of Revelation. And we said John's whole purpose for writing, he gave the purpose statement at the end of the book. He said, listen, I wrote these things to you so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life. This is a key theme in John's gospel. It's talked about 36 times. He wants people to know that life is only found by believing in Jesus Christ. And so he wrote a 21-chapter book to help us see Jesus so that you can believe in Jesus, so that you can have real life. And then we pick up in verse 6. It's where we left off last week. I'm encouraging you to bring your Bibles. You bring your Bible saver. It's a sword drill. You hold your Bibles up. Hold them up if you brought them. All right? Oh, come on, guys. we got to do better than that. All right? Hold your Bibles up. Get your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. We're going to use them. Because I want you to open up. Open up to John chapter 1 right now. We're going to be in John 1. All right? I'd love for you to just follow along with us. If you need a Bible, come see us. We'll help you get a Bible. We have a couple here that we can give you. We want you to be in the Bible. Read the Bible. John chapter 1, verse 6 says this, There is a man sent from God 
whose name was John. We're going to find out, right, this is not John who's writing. This is not him talking about himself. Remember I told you last week, John doesn't call himself John at all in the letter. He uses author's modesty. He doesn't want himself to be in the spotlight at all in his own gospel. It's all about Jesus for John. So he, doesn't even, he gave himself a little nickname. He called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. But he doesn't refer to himself by his name. So this is a different John. We're going to find out it's John the Baptist. We'll talk about him in a minute. So there was a, a man sent from God whose name was John. And he came as a witness to testify about the light. So that all may or all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Okay? So, a um, couple observations, a couple things about this verse, the little side notes, but I think they're important. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about this John the Baptist and who he is and what did he do and what does that mean for you and me. A couple observations. Number one, here's the first thing it's there in the first sentence. There was a man sent from God. Here's the first thing that I want you to understand this morning and get is that we have a God who sends. We have a God who, who is in the business of sending people. That's, that's part of the nature of who he is, is that he sends people. And here's what you and I need to understand. It's always been his plan and it always will be his plan that God's plan for reaching people is to send other people to reach those people. It's always been his plan. You read through the Bible. The, the, the page after page is basically this. The whole Bible is basically a God sending people people to reach people. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, we have a God who sends, and he's still in the sending business today. You know what is a good prayer that you and I should pray every morning when you wake up? Pray this tomorrow morning. God, who are you sending me to today? God, where are you sending me today? God, how are you sending me today? If you don't think you're a sent one, you're going to miss out on a big part of what it means to follow after the Father. Because the Father sends. That's what's, he's a sending God. And, and so um, it's, it's his plan A, friends. There's no other plan to reach the world for Jesus than to send people. And we've got to just, we just got to stop with, you know, a lot of us have a lot of really lame excuses sometimes. Oh, I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not an extrovert, or I'm, I'm not good with my words, or I've never been good at explaining, or I, I just, you know, I'm not. And we have all these reasons, and it, it's, it's like it reminds me of the story back in the Bible <coughs> of Moses, when God was trying to send Moses, and Moses put up a fight, like he didn't want to be sent, and he said no, and he had all these excuses, all these lame excuses, the same excuses that you and I talk about today. He's like, well, I don't, I don't talk well. He said, I speak with faltering lips, right? And he had, and God's like, I'll show you what to say. And he's like, I'm a nobody. If they ask who I am, what do I, what do I say if they ask who I am? And, and he's just like, just tell them I am sent. And God's like, don't worry about who you are. It's about who I am. It's like you're not even really important in the deal. It's all about who I am. And so Moses had all these excuses. And, and God just one after a time just picked them off. And, and we've got to come to the point where even today still we've got to understand that our father is one who sends. He sends his kids into the world to be little lights. And this is, this is what we're finding here with John. Is that he sent John, this John the Baptist we'll talk about in a minute, to, to let his light shine, to talk about the one true light. I asked a Saturday night crowd last night, I'll ask you guys this morning, will anyone be in heaven because you let your light shine in front of them and you were sent to them? Will there be any sweet reunions that you have in heaven with somebody who you, you, took, you had courage, you stepped out of your comfort zone, you were praying for them, you stepped out, you kind of planted a seed, maybe you fumbled it, maybe it didn't go right, they said no, it came back, but you persisted and you're like, I'm going to let my light, I'm going to love this person, I'm going to be Jesus, this might be the only Jesus this person ever sees, I'm going to let my light shine. 
Will anybody be in heaven because you were courageous enough and faithful enough and obedient enough to live out your sentness and to live as a sent one? God sends people, and this is what he's doing here. He's sending John. And here's my, my personal opinion based upon what I, I, I think Scripture, not just my gut feeling. Based upon Scripture, I'm just telling you this is my opinion. I think time is short, friends. I think time is short until the Lord starts doing some of the things that are talked about in the end of this book. And so do not wait. Do not think that you have more time. That I'll later, I'll, I'll tell them later, don't put off to tomorrow what God is inviting you to do today. Time is short. So this guy, John, who's, who is this man sent from God? His name is John. His name is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was an interesting guy. He is, he is the hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's the bridge between, between the ways of the Old Testament and then the last 400 years of the Old Testament were called the silent years because there was no prophet. There was no prophetic voice. There was no message from heaven of God calling. It was kind of the preparatory phase for the start of the New Testament. And it starts with the person of John. John the Baptist is the one. He, what an amazing privilege to announce to the world that Jesus is coming. The Savior is coming. We've waited hundreds of years for this Messiah and get ready because he's coming. That was John's role. He's talked about 89 times in the Bible, John the Baptist. There's only two people in the Old Testament that are prophesied and predicted to come in the New Testament. Want to guess who the two are? Who's the first one? Jesus, good answer, right? Who's the second one? John the Baptist. They're the only two in the Old Testament predicted to come and awaiting somebody to come is the Son of God and the one who's announcing the coming of the Son of God. And so John the Baptist plays a very special role. He was actually Jesus' cousin, his older cousin. And Jesus said about him in Matthew chapter 11, I tell you that there is nobody born of a woman that is greater than John the Baptist. Right? And so this, this individual God sends into the world to say, get ready, because he's coming. Prepare the way. He goes on in verse 9 and says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. So John, as he did last week, continues to call Jesus the light, right? And we'll unpack that more. What does it mean for Jesus to be the light? Um, we'll, when we get to chapter 8, in, in John chapter 8 is where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so we, we'll really unpack that more fully, that concept of Jesus being the light and what does it mean for us to be part of the light. But right, right now, you just need to know that John continues to call him the light and says this, he was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. Right? John said last week already that he was there in the very beginning when everything was made. The whole world was created through him. So since Jesus is God, has always existed, the world was made through him, and here's what we have. Now we have the creator not being recognized by the created. The created looks at the one that created them, them, the creator, and says, I don't know you. I don't recognize you. This is what John's saying. Basically, the world is saying, I don't know you, maker, creator. The created wants nothing to do with the creator. Here's, here's the truth this morning, friends. Some people just don't want to see the light. Some people just don't want the light. They want to stay in darkness. They want to stay on the path of darkness. And unfortunately, no matter how much you let your light shine, no matter how much you love, how much you serve, how much you care, how much you help, how much you plant seeds, how much you let your light shine, they don't want to recognize the light. And even though Jesus made their eyes, their eyes are blind towards him. And even though Jesus made their ears as the creator, they don't want to hear his invitation to come. Even though Jesus made their whole body as the creator, the created does not want to bow that body in humble submission and kneel before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
The world is rejecting Jesus. It does not recognize him. John goes on and says, not even his own people, not even Jesus' own people. That's what he says next in verse 11. It says, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. All right? John, John the Baptist, John was a Jew. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus came to his own people, the nation of Israel, that had been waiting for him for hundreds of years for this promised deliverer, Messiah, that was going to come The whole Old Testament looks forward to this. And so 400 years of silence, John comes, says, he's coming, he's coming, get ready, prepare the way, make your path straight, prepare the way, the Lord is coming. And then Jesus comes and they go, nah, and reject him because he did not come in a way that they were expecting, right? The Old Testament people wanted their conquering king to come. They had this picture of this conquering king. And here comes Jesus, a suffering servant, born in lowly Bethlehem. They wanted their king riding in on a white horse. And here comes Jesus riding in on a donkey. They just had this picture. (laughs) This king came and said, I'm going to die. What kind of king is going to give up his own life for his subjects? They missed, the Jewish people missed their Savior, their Messiah, their Deliverer. John says his own people didn't receive him. In the Old Testament, um, God, God would try to speak to Israel, would speak to his people. He'd send people, this is, he'd send prophets to speak to his people and say, come on, come on, get, you change, you got to stop. Jeremiah was one of those people. God tapped Jeremiah to speak to his own people. And here's God speaking to Israel through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7. God says to Israel, Since the day your ancestors came out of the land of Egypt until today, I have sent all my servants, the prophets, to you time and time again. However, my people wouldn't listen to me or pay attention, but became obstinate. They did more evil than their ancestors. They did not want to see the light either. And because Israel rejected Jesus, this is, this is actually ends up in God's sovereignty, opening the door then for us Gentiles. That God then says, okay, you're not going to receive your deliverer, Savior. Then we're going to open up the door for the whole world, for Gentiles to now be, Paul says in Romans, grafted into this family tree. I'm going to make the invitation open to everybody. And now we come to verse 12, which I think is one of the most incredible verses in all of the Bible. In verse uh, 12 of chapter 1, John says, But to all who did receive him, everybody who doesn't reject him, but those who do receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. What an incredible verse. There's so much packed in this verse that we could just spend a weeks on here. I, I, want, I do want to push pause here. I just want to unpack this a little bit here because there is such deep, nuggets of truth that we need to unmine here to understand all that is involved in being called a child of God. Do you, that's, that is what has happened here, is that God literally adopts you into his family. And it changes everything. And this is why people get so... Um, misinformed or confused or have a wrong picture of, of Christianity just being religion about rules and rituals. It's like it is so much more when you understand truly what's happened that you were spiritually lost and God saw you in your lostness and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to adopt you and bring you into my family and now I will be your father. I will spiritually father you. There's so many implications. I mean, so many any uh, implications about this. The language of the Bible is adoption. This is in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, and I want you to notice this, every spiritual blessing 
in the heavens that are in Christ. So in other words, listen, in, in Israel's history, in Jewish tradition, the firstborn son got a double portion of inheritance than the others, right? And so here's what God is saying. Every spiritual blessing that um, is Jesus's as the only son of God, he's actually, he's like, I'm going to give to you as well because I'm, I'm bringing you into my family. This is what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed, what? Who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavens that's in Christ. We get brought into the family. This is incredible. Verse 4, he chose us. He went to the spiritual orphanage. And said, I'm picking you, and I'm picking you, and I'm picking you, and I'm picking you, and I'm picking you, I'm picking you. All these spiritual orphans that were hopeless spiritually on your own to do nothing about your own condition. And he goes, I'm picking you. He chose us before the foundation of the world, before you were even born, before he even made everything. This was part of his plan. So it's not based upon how good you're being or how bad you're being. or It has nothing to do with you. This is the crazy thing. It has everything to do with his sovereign love that he chose before the foundation of the world to say, I'm choosing you to be holy and blameless in love before him. Verse 5, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he had lavished on us. There is so much that is packed into this concept of now being adopted into God's family and being a child of God. We could spend the rest of the day and all next week talking about it. I just picked out seven that I want to highlight real quick. Seven truths about because you and I are a child of God, what does that mean? And I, I, want, I want this to hit you. So you need Some of you, you need to believe this. Because here's the problem. Some people are still living like spiritual orphans. You're still living, and this is what we do. We believe in God. We believe his word. We believe heaven awaits us. We believe God is good. And we believe all that, and then we go over here and we live life on our own. And we live as if we've not been adopted into the family where our dad is the king. It changes everything, listen, about your identity of being a son or a daughter of the king. It changes everything. And we have to learn to live from this identity rather than living from the identity of being a spiritual orphan where you got to fend for yourself. you got to try really hard. you got to make it on your own. And if it's going to be, it's up to me. And, and, I, and so, like, we've got to learn to live from this place of being a child. This is why Jesus said, unless you become like one of what? You don't have a place in heaven. One of what? One of these little children. Like, depend upon the father. Like a, like a child who's, who's helpless. The problem is we grow up and we think we got this. And we get all proud and self-sufficient, which is why in James it says God opposes the proud. God's like, oh, you don't need me. Oh, you'll need me on that day when you want the key to get into heaven. But like that, and for us, don't you let me? It's like, no, we want to live as a, as a child of God the whole time. So as a child of God, real quick, seven things. Number one, I'm unconditionally loved. I cannot earn the love of God. He already decided in eternity past he was going to love me. I'm unconditionally loved. You are unconditionally loved. No matter what you do, God cannot not love you. This is un unbelievable. As a parent who unconditionally loves their kid, doesn't matter what grades they bring home, doesn't matter, all right? You don't love them less if you're a good parent, which God is. Number two, I'm truly accepted. Like, I'm okay. Yeah, but I did this. God goes, I know. Yeah, but then I thought about, and God goes, I know. And I'm like, yeah, but then I didn't do it. And he's like, I know. Accepted. Your acceptance to me is not based upon your performance. Thank God. Yeah, number three, I'm a child of God. It means I have an inheritance. It means I, because I've been adopted into this family, 
that the Father has provided this unbelievable inheritance that awaits us in the future. It's a game changer. What's the worst that can, you can do to me down here? Kill me? Great. I'll get my inheritance. I'll go home. All right? Not only then, it's not only a future inheritance, it's an inheritance that starts trickling down to us now, that we get to experience here while we're living life in the middle, that we have our God who's with us, who shares with us now and here. We have an inheritance. Because I'm a child of God, number four, I no longer have to live in fear. No longer do you have to live with the fear of man, or the, even worse, the fear of God. The, listen, the parent-child relationship should not be one that is anchored in fear, right? Where a, a child has to fear the parent, has to cower in fear because they didn't do it. They spilt the milk because they didn't do this, or they forgot to put the dog out. And so that's not a healthy relationship where the child cowers in fear, and so because God already fully loves you and fully accepts you, your relationship is not one based on fear. It says in 1 John chapter 4, perfect love drives out fear. God gives us perfect love. He's always there for you. You don't have to fear anything. You don't face anything alone. What's the toughest thing you're going to face? God's right there with you. You're never alone. Number five, you've been given power and authority. Now, while you live life here in the middle, you have the family name on the back of your shirt. God. God's kid. And you walk around, and any time that the enemy wants to come against you, you just turn around and be like, you got to deal with my dad. I belong to him. You, listen, you and I move in the world that our father owns and created. Have power and authority over the enemy over sin, I no longer have to be a slave to. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I have spiritual authority, not of my own. I just go, because my dad said so. That's why. Oh, you're that kid. Yeah, I am that kid when it comes to being a Christian. That's my, my dad said so. That's, that's authority that I have. Number six, I'm part of a forever family. Look around. You better like these people because we're going to spend forever together. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But we've been given this family, a forever family that extends beyond this building that is there to encourage you, is there to help you, is there to pick you, is there to walk with you so you don't have to lone ranger Christianity and get through life alone. We've been given forever family in number seven. I, I now have meaning and purpose in my life. Right? I, I feel so bad for individuals when I talk to these the, the, the serious skeptics or atheists or agnostics that they just say things like, well, I, we don't know where we came from and we don't know where we're going. And then, therefore, there's really no significance to life in the middle. If you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going, then all of this is just pretty much meaningless. It's all just haphazard, random chance that we're here. So there's no purpose. There's no greater purpose, than I, right? And so many people live life that way when it's, in fact, the complete opposite, that we have an intelligent designer, a loving creator who made us, that there is a final destination where we're going. And so life now in the middle has incredible meaning, incredible purpose, incredible significance. I'm part of the family business of my father, Right? These are just seven things that happen because I'm a child of God. We could go on and on and on and on. There is so much packed into this verse here. You need to believe these are true about you because God adopts you into his family. I love what Paul Tripp um, says about um, these things. He, he wrote um, several amazing books. I forget which book this comes from, but I know it comes from Paul Tripp. Let me just read them to you. He said, if you're God's child... You needn't fear exposure. Nothing could be revealed about you that hasn't been covered by the blood of Jesus. If you're God's child, you don't fight sin on your own since you have been blessed with the convicting, protecting, rescuing grace of the Spirit. If you're God's child, you've been freed from seeking horizontally what you've already been given in Christ. 
If you're God's child, you live between two realities. Enemies greater than your strength, spiritually speaking, and grace that's greater than these enemies. If you're God's child, you don't have to search for meaning and purpose. You're part of the most important work in the universe, redemption. So listen, when you take all of this in and you believe it and you receive it and you meditate on it, you know what ends up happening? Here's what ends up happening. You and I recognize we need to stop living as spiritual orphans who are trying to do life on your own. God wants to be a part of your life every day. He's a good father. Stop treating him only like you see him on weekends. Every day, the father loves you unconditionally, wants to speak to you, all right? You're a child of God. Some of you, this is hard to to take in because you believe lies. Let me tell you the truth. You are not your past. You are not your mistakes. You are not your failures. You are not your sins. You are not your screw-ups. You are not who others say you are. You are not the names that have been labeled and hung on you. You know who you are? You are who your father says you are. You are a beloved child of God. And you and I need to learn to live intimately from that identity as a child of God that loves to crawl up on the lap of the loving father and be guided through life that way. It will change your life. Being adopted into God's family changes everything. And there's too many Christians out there that have good theology and live as spiritual orphans. They know and believe the truth about the gospel and Jesus and the cross and salvation, and then they live every day on their own. That's a spirit of spiritual orphanage. And God goes, come on, live as a child of the king. All this is wrapped up in this verse. Verse 12, let's look at it again. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. There's so much more we could do. We're running out of time, and I got more verses to go, so let's go faster here. Verse 13, it says this. This is crazy, too. He goes on and says, To all who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. So all of this is God's will. Is God's, it had this come about, not by the will of man. In other words, you didn't choose God. He chose you, right? Not by natural descent. That was a verse or a phrase for the Jews. Listen, just because your family lineage traces you back to Abraham, Father Abraham, doesn't mean you're good to go. Doesn't mean you're automatically in the kingdom. You have to believe and receive in Jesus. Just being nationally born that way doesn't mean you're good of natural descent, right? All of this is because God, it's, he, it's the will of God. He chose us. We didn't choose him. He chose us. This all happens because of God's grace. How? How did this happen? How did the adoption papers get signed? Next verse is the verse we looked at last week. Here's how. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So much here to still unpack. Two things I want to talk about here real fast. Number one is this idea of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. This is the Christmas story. It's it's a miracle. God became a man while not stopping being God. So nobody has ever before and nobody ever will be like Jesus, who was at the same time 100% God and 100% man. You're like, that's 200%. I know, this is how God does math. Right? But it's, it is in the person of Jesus who was at the same time 100% God and 100% man, yet lived on this earth fully as a real man, right? You can't be like, well, his God shield kind of kept him from getting hungry. So when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he really wasn't hungry because he was God. Oh, no, no, no. He was hungry. 
He was a man. He was a real man. He felt pain. He felt emotion. He, he went to the bathroom. Like he, he had these experiences as a real man. When Lazarus died, he, he wept. He, it says in Hebrews chapter 4 that he was tempted in every way like we were. He, he can identify with, you know, those commercials that are being run that, like anything now with Christians, we, we fight it or we love it. And it's like we can't even decide. The ones that say he gets us that happened during the Super Bowl, there were two of them. I think we're really well done. And some people are like, oh, that's a terrible waste of money. And other people are like, no, it opens a door. And we can, we'll fight about anything nowadays. We just will. We will fight about anything. And then I'm just tired of fighting. Like, they may tired of fighting. Can we just stop fighting about everything? Red, blue, no, up, down, no. I, I, just, we all just need to shut up, I think, sometimes, too. <laughs> Everyone's got an opinion. Like, but so, sorry, that is nothing. That's just a rabbit trail. But, you Come on, that should have gotten a lot of amens. Because, well, some of you out there are the people that are fighting. And you're like, oh, I, I, tell me you shut up, Pastor, right? <laughs> this, is, this, is the, this is the whole thing with this he gets us. Is, is, and I don't, I don't know a ton about it. And I think they're doing some good in trying to get people to just in the door of the gospel, right? Just in the door to know about who Jesus is. That the whole idea is he did live as a man. So he did experience hunger. He did experience pain. He did experience, he, he, does, he does get us because he lived in, in a way, this is what the Hebrew says, every way that you and I have been tempted, he was tempted, yet he did not sin. Why? Because he came and he took on flesh and he lived in a man and he dwelt among us. This word for dwelt is the, he, is the Greek word for tabernacle. It, it literally means he made his house. He tabernacled with us. It was a, it's a echoing back to the Old Testament in, in, in Exodus 33 and 34 when Moses was leading the Israelites through the desert and, um, and, and God was with them. And when they stopped and they set up base camp, they set up a tent. It was called the Tent of Meeting. You can go out to Lancaster and see a replication of it and go out and see an actual tent. And that's where God dwelled. And people would go to meet, where Moses would meet with God. It was, it's this word, dwelt. It means to, to make his home there. God came down and tabernacled with us. In the Old Testament, he tabernacled in the tent. Then David came along who had a son named Solomon. And Solomon's like, no tent is good enough. I'm building my God a temple. And he built him a beautiful temple, and it got destroyed. And now there's no temple. And God doesn't dwell in a temple anymore. You know where God dwells now? He dwells in living temples. Everywhere you go is a temple. And that's what God does. He dwells in living temples. And so this idea of letting your light shine, you're not letting you shine, right? Right? This is not a, uh, when I say he sent you and who's going to be in heaven because this is not you using your skills and your personality. Like, I, don't let your personality shine. That's not what we're asking you to do. You and I are just carriers. We're vessels of, we're living temples of Jesus in us so Jesus should come through us. We're saying let Jesus shine through you, right? Because that's where Jesus now dwells. He now lives in us. And then it says he came full of of grace and truth. And we've talked about this verse off and on here at Next over the last year, and I, I continue to be convinced that um, this figuring this this part out is is going to be key for the church to be the church moving forward in our culture. And how did we do these two things, grace and truth? Because they feel like opposites. Right? They feel like opposites, grace and truth. And Jesus was full of both of them. Right? Where truth, truth stands there. Truth stands there and says, no, no, there is truth. There is right and therefore there is wrong. There is truth and therefore there's lies. There's correct and there's therefore error. There are standards. Right? And that's what truth stands there and declares that and holds to that. But then grace comes along. And grace comes along and goes, it's going to be okay. You're forgiven. You're still loved. As you are. Imperfect. Loved. And grace washes over all this. And we struggle with these two things because they feel like they're such opposites and they compete against one another. 
And Jesus was perfectly full of both of them. And I've told you before, chances are you gravitate towards one or the other. And this is what we're seeing happen even in the church today. We're seeing churches push like to the extremes, which usually extremes are usually bad and dangerous, right? You see churches that are way over here and they're just beating people up with the truth. And there's no love, right? And it's like they're wielding God's word like a weapon against the very people that they're supposed to be loving. And then you see churches that are way over here that are going so far left that they're just doing away with the word of God in the name of love, in the name of grace, and be like, anything goes, do what you want, everything's okay, we'll accept you as you are. It's like, and both of those things feel like not the way of Jesus because he married these two things perfectly together, full of grace and truth. And so I pray that you would wrestle with that this week. Chances are you you lean one way or another. Chances are your spouse leans the other way. It's usually the way it goes because opposites attract. It's the way it is in the Snyder family, right? I always joke with my wife, she's Old Testament law, I'm New Testament grace. <laughs> Kids were young, don't run, there's no running in the house, don't run in the house. I'm over here saying, let them run in the house, they're having fun, it's okay, right? Why can't they run in the house? Because you don't run in the house. Who says you don't run in the house? You guys? Yeah, she does. And so they didn't run in the house. And so, exactly right. And we figure out how to make it work. And we balance each other out, grace and truth. But I need more truth. She needs more grace. And God's working on both of us. <clears throat> but church, we've got to figure out grace and truth because this is how Jesus did. And he lived in such a way that was perfect. And he's our model. He's our elder brother. He's the example. Worship team, come. Let me just read the last couple of verses here and we'll stop. Jesus testified, verse 15. Jesus testified, excuse me, John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one whom I said, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I mean, John knew. John knew his cousin wasn't just his cousin. John knew that he was Jesus, the Savior of the world that always existed. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. That's what grace is. Grace just comes from God like the waves of the seashore. It's just wave after wave. And thank God for his grace. Thank God that your condition and your standing before God today has nothing to do with how you behave today. Oh, thank God for his grace that this washes over all of our sins that were dumped on Jesus on the cross that paid for them all. It's amazing grace. That God then says, so come be a part of my family. The law, verse 17, the law was given through Moses. Here, we're going to see truth and grace right here in this verse. The law, Old Testament law, truth was given through Moses. And then he says... Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There it was. The law, you know what the law did? The law just pointed out everything you did wrong. It just showed you you're not good enough. That's what the Old Testament law did. Everyone's a lawbreaker. Crap, what do we do about that? You can't do anything. You can't keep the law. That's why we needed grace. <laughs> grace comes along and says, I got this. And grace covers over all our failures of the law in the person of Jesus if you could dig out for me verse 12, if you could find verse 12, and that's how I want to end, and we'll close in worship. For some of you, you need to get the most important thing here about adoption and being a child of God and all those things we talked about. Listen, that is only true for those. I want you to notice the two things that go here. But to all who did receive him, he gave those people the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name, the same people. So there's two parts here that you've got to make sure. You are not a child of God if you haven't believed in Jesus, that he is the Savior, he's the Son of God, and received him. 
And those things are important because the Bible says the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The demons believe that Jesus is God, but they haven't received him as Savior. There's a difference between just believing something and saying, no, I'm receiving it into my life. So have you believed and received in Jesus? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Otherwise, you're not a child of God. And you can do that right now. That's how, that's how we're going to close. Right now, everyone, close your eyes, bow your heads. If this is you, you not, you're not sure. You can be sure, 100% sure right now by just telling God, I'm believing and receiving. I'll help you. Say something like this in the inside, quietly, you and God. God, today I believe. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that I have sinned. I believe that I need a Savior. And I believe Jesus is him. He is my Savior. And today, I not only believe, but I'm saying, Jesus, I receive you. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I, receive, I want you in my life. I receive you as who you are, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, my Savior. Jesus, come save me now. In Jesus' name.